Fritz Mayer, Dean of the Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver and proud home of ICAP, the uh, International Career Advancement Program, uh, today's sponsor of the program. ICAP has for 25 years helped promote greater diversity in foreign affairs um, and now has more than 700 alumni uh, who've taken part in its annual programs in, in Aspen, Colorado. Um, and uh, today's program could hardly be more timely. You know, for many years, the United States, for all our failings um, at home and abroad, uh, represented for many around the world a, a model that could be emulated, a model of diversity and tolerance and equity and justice and democracy and shared prosperity, whether true or not, at least the image was uh, was there. And it, it enabled the U.S. in many ways to be an effective voice advocating for those values in international affairs. Political scientists called it soft power. Well, today, probably our soft power is much diminished if it still exists at all. And there are a lot of factors involved there, but perhaps among them is the uh, is the global salience of our domestic failings, um, uh, dysfunction of our politics, the manufactured controversy over Black Lives Matter, Matter and critical race theory in the 1619 Project, and a host of other things, gun violence, you know, enduring disparities, health disparities, wealth gap, and more. So today's question, um, given all this, the question is whether the United States can be an effective global advocate for racial uh, equity and justice. With me to discuss this question is a fabulous panel, distinguished uh, group. Um, and let me introduce them quickly, and then we'll get to our conversation. Uh, Margaret Wong, ICAP uh, alum, 2003, uh, is the president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, an advocate for human rights and racial justice for nearly three decades. Margaret has championed social justice and human dignity, advocating for an end to discrimination and oppression in all its forms. Prior to the Southern Poverty Law Center, she served as executive director of Amnesty International USA, uh, where she was responsible for leading campaigns to protect the human rights of migrants and refugees, tortured survivors, gun violence victims, and activists and protesters around the globe. Um, Margaret holds a Master of International Affairs from Columbia University and a Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University. Welcome, Margaret. Um, Darren Johnson, ICAP 2010, uh, is Associate Professor of Law at Howard University School of Law and Director of the Master of Laws program there, where he teaches international law, human rights, and national security uh, courses. Professor Johnson's research interests include constitutional reform, transitional justice, and the rule of law in post-conflict uh, states, as well as the balance between human rights and national security law and policy in the United States and globally. His extensive experience in government, um, the attorney at the uh, Pentagon, um, in the Secretary of the Army General's uh, General Counsel's Office, uh, uh, an attorney advisor in the U.S. State Department's Legal Advisor's Office in the Office of the White House Counsel uh, under President Obama. Uh, President, uh, Professor Johnson received his B.A. from Yale College and his J.D. from Harvard Law School. Um, welcome. Uh, uh, Michael Arona, ICAP 2001, um, is Senior Advisor for Strategic Global Policy and Ind Indigenous Rights in the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. With over 20 years of U.S. Department of State uh, experience, he's held a variety of senior-level foreign policy advisory positions, um, providing uh, analytical and advisory support for planning, development, and execution of U.S. foreign policy in Africa and East Asia, served in the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi, uh, where he negotiated the re release of human, three human rights um, and religious prisoners of conscience and paved the way for the first visit of the International Human Rights NGO in the country. Um, uh, he established the U.S. State Department's Sudan Atrocities Documentation Team, um, which investigated violence in Darfur. Um, uh, Michael uh, received uh, MS in military and strategic policy studies from the U.S. Marine Corps University Command and Staff College in Quantico. Welcome, Michael. 
uh, and last and certainly not least, is my colleague, uh, Ajane Clemens, Assistant Professor of Public Policy at the Corbell School. Uh, Ajane researches the, uh, the policing of marginalized communities in democratic contexts, particularly the United States and Europe. Uh, she teaches courses on the politics of the policy pro making process, intersectional inequality, as well as state violence and local security. Prior to her academic career, Ajane worked for the city and county of Denver as the community relations ombudsman, uh, and subsequently as policy director for a National Professional Association of Black State Legislators in Washington. Um, uh, there she helped build co coalitions with the Native American, Asian American, and Hispanic legislative caucuses. Ajane is a BA in international relations, uh, uh, Latin American history and Spanish from Drake University, and earned her PhD in public policy from the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. So welcome, Ajane. Welcome, all of you. Um, let's get started. So let's just start with the big question the, that we really frame the whole conversation around. And just I ask each of you to make some sort of, op of opening remarks and thoughts about the, the question, can the United States be an effective global advocate for racial equity and justice? And why don't we just take it in the order I introduced you? Um, we'll start with you, Margaret. Thanks so much, Fritz. It's really an honor and a privilege to be with this group of people. So I'm delighted to have the chance to join you and to be part of this discussion. Um, many of you will know, I, I know that some of you I've had the chance to um, meet in the past at other uh, Denver events. And many of you will know that I like to cite uh, Carol Anderson's book, Eyes Off the Prize, which is an early response to this question. Um, you know, was the United States ever actually in a role to, uh, to advocate on behalf of uh, people facing various types of discrimination to ensure equity in their human rights protection? Um, and the answer has always been no, the US has never been <laughs> a true champion. Um, although I would say that over history, actually there's no government that's ever been a perfect champion of human rights um, on behalf of all people. And at different moments in time, different governments have um, different abilities to try to push an agenda. And that's really what you hope for. Um, it's never that your own government or any government is, um, uh, absent of any of their own policies that they need to address and reconsider, but rather that with different administrations and different priorities being set by the State Department, we have opportunities to advance human rights protections for different constituencies. And the U.S. has been an invaluable ally on some of those efforts and um, definitely a counter and a, and a target for others. Um, so it has really varied over time. One of the things that I have done with the Southern Poverty Law Center is actually to recognize that as a domestically focused organization, using international mechanisms is one of the opportunities to lift up these issues and to demonstrate that they're not solely a US concern or a domestic policy issue. Rather, these are our global concerns. And so in the last uh, year, the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, has been engaging in international advocacy. We've applied for our uh, NGO status at the United Nations, mm. uh, still pending. The government of China still has concerns about our application. Hopefully, we'll get through that soon. Um, but we've participated actively in the third review of the United States record, um, as well as right now we're engaged with a working group on people of African descent uh, and lifting up a whole host of issues. From my perspective, um, what's really interesting is the comparative advocacy efforts. Um, people in the United States might imagine that we have opportunity or benefit that others in other countries don't and are frequently quite shocked to hear that the situation in the US for particular communities, particular states, and I include the Deep South in those states, actually have it far worse than many of our ally countries in the world. And so I think the opportunity of using a global arena to really lift up the challenges here domestically, but also to draw connections is really important. And my last comment, I don't wanna take up too much time, is that one of the things the SPLC is most well known for, of course, is our work on hate and extremism. 
this is something we've been looking at nationally for the last 30 plus years. And I'm dismayed to share with you that this is an increasingly global phenomenon as well. We're not seeing extremist groups only active here in the United States, but we're seeing them become quite active and to, to take undertake um, extremely serious and violent attacks in many other parts of the world. Um, and this is something that we are going to have to find a global solution to. It's not something that we can only tackle here domestically in the US but it is hand in hand with the other threats against our democracy. And I look forward to more discussion on all of these. Thank you, Fritz. Absolutely. I, I, I look forward as well. We'll be sure to come back to those themes, uh, absolutely. Um, um, let's go, um, uh, Darren, uh, your, your initial thoughts. Uh, thank you so much, Fritz. And let me uh, first say uh, thank you to um, the Joseph Corbel School for inviting me to participate in this panel. And, and thank you so much to um, ICAP um, for its fantastic work um, in increasing the diversity of uh, foreign policy leadership uh, in the US. So, you know, in response to the, the question of the panel, um, my answer would be yes, the US could be an effective global advocate for racial equity and justice. However, there is much that the US would need to do in order to become that effective global advocate for racial equity and justice. And in my view, nearly all of that work must be done within the United States. This uh, linkage between racial injustice within the United States uh, and US global leadership is nothing new. If we look back at the mid 20th century during the Cold War and the civil rights movement, racial injustice in the United States undermined US global leadership and the United States' ability to achieve its geopolitical objectives. That's not just my view, right? It's a view that was on record from the United States itself. I wanna take a moment to just reflect on the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education case, right? In that case, the US State Department filed an amicus brief with the, with the Supreme Court of the United States and that brief was in favor of desegregation, right? The State Department cited the impediment that racial segregation was having in the State Department's ability to achieve US geopolitical objectives, including, right, at that time, persuading newly decolonizing states to align themselves with the United States and Western democracies rather than with the Eastern Bloc. The United States, um, as many will recall, was being savaged in Russian propaganda globally for the rampant lynchings, beatings, racial discrimination, and, and, and the all around horrific treatment of African Americans and other minority communities. So the State Department argued in its amicus brief to the United States Supreme Court that the court must eliminate racial segregation in order for the United States to persuasively champion our form of liberal democracy in the world. So as we all know, uh, the Supreme Court did find racial segregation uh, in this particular case in the school system to be unconstitutional. And legal scholar Derek Bell, who was seen by many, right, as the godfather of critical race theory, he referred to this decision by the Supreme Court as reflecting something called interest, interest convergence, right? And so in, in Bell's view, the interest of African Americans in achieving racial equality in the United States converged with the interest of US institutional elites, and that resulted in a civil rights advance for African Americans and other communities. So I would argue that the same trends that we saw during the mid 20th century apply to our domestic and global conversation around racial equity and justice today. Right, right now, we've experienced for the past decade a mass political movement for racial justice in the United States in the form of Black Lives Matter, which in many ways became a global protest movement following the killing of George Floyd. And right now, the United States is engaged in a geopolitical debate to persuade states around the world to continue to align themselves with liberal democracies rather than authoritarianism. And US racial injustice in the form of police killings of black and brown men, women, and children has been weaponized against the United States 
by its geopolitical adversaries in international organizations, in global debates, and even through a cyber polarization campaign directed against the US electorate ourselves. So in my view, the current moment is ripe for intentional interest convergence. The US must become an effective global advocate for racial equity and justice by dedicating serious sustained effort to, to addressing racial inequity and justice at home. This is not only in the United States geopolitical interests, it is most importantly in the human rights interests of our diverse American citizen. Thank you, Darren. Um, well, a lot, we're, we're gonna have, we need, we probably need two hours now. Uh, maybe we'll extend the uh, <laughs> to so rich. Uh, thank you. Um, let me turn to, to Michael for your, your first thoughts. Absolutely. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to be here. So I want to thank you first and foremost for the invitation to participate and uh, honor to be on this panel. Um, before I get started, it's customary for Native peoples to introduce ourselves in our native language. So let me first start by, by doing that. Michael Arona, she said. And also before going forward, I just uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that I am in Washington, D.C. on the ancestral lands of the Anacostan, the Piscataway, and the Pamunkey peoples. And uh, we honor their resilience, and I want to pay respect to their elders, both past, present, and, and emerging. So uh, I, I welcome Darren's and, and Margaret's uh, intervention in, in, in points, uh, and I'm glad they focus on domestic and, and global solutions. Uh, to answer the question, I, I do believe the United States can be an effective global advocate for racial justice, but it can't be business as usual. And let me take a moment to, to explain that. Um, I don't want to talk myself out of a job either, so let me let me do that. <laughs> but my global mandate is to, is to work in the support of the State Department's uh, Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice uh, as a senior advisor on Indigenous rights. So it's my responsibility to to partner to to work with foreign government officials. Uh, members of international indigenous communities to ensure that U.S. foreign policy protects and, and also advances the rights of indigenous communities. Not, and let me say this again, underscore this, not because we have solved these challenges here at home in the United States, but rather, as, as, as my two colleagues have, have stated, but rather because we recognize that these are global challenges that require coordinated and sustained global solutions. Global racial inequality, political, social, economic marginalization has, has affected different groups and communities around the world for, for far too long. In the past, US foreign policy did not confront the issue of race, uh, racial inequality, ethnic inequality, and marginalization. And this has been problematic. And I would say and highlight that this has not been confronted until now, under this administration. And I believe it's important to underscore, first and foremost, that advancing the rights of, of marginalized communities, advancing the rights of, of indigenous peoples, advancing the rights of all people of color around the world will ensure more stable, uh, inclusive societies, a more prosperous economies, and, and also more peaceful nations. And I would say that this is inherently good for all of us as a member of, a, of the global community. Now, Besides being the, the morally right thing to do, it is in our global security interests to address racial inequities faced by indigenous peoples, to address inequities faced by all people of color. Uh, we can look around the world uh, and regional conflicts uh, around the world demonstrate that marginalized groups are subject to compounding and disproportionate harm. But uh, societies that do successfully address deep-rooted disparities tend to be more peaceful, uh, more prosperous, and more stable. Now, that said, what this work is not and cannot be is the United States lecturing or admonishing other governments. I believe it is important to approach this work with great, great humility, as we in this country uh, still have a lot of work to do here at home to fully address the realities of systemic racism. Now, also, the United States, I would say, is not a unique leader in fighting inequality, but we instead must be part of a unified global community that stands against racism and the oppression of marginalized communities. 
Now, we all know, as, as, as members have already said, that our credibility to lead on these issues, to lead on the issues of, of, of racial and ethnic equity begins here at home. Absolutely agree. And, and we must be uh, take a critical assessment of our policies, of our programs, and also our engagements, uh, as, as the State Department does, also in, in every country around the world. And how our work is either supporting and uplifting these communities, or we need to face the hard truth and acknowledging where we are failing to address their marginalization. Now, let me just finally underscore that we cannot ask of others what we ourselves are unwilling to do, nor can we as United States afford, avoid rather the discussion of our, our past or the ongoing challenges. And this includes no matter how hard or ugly it may be our, our own history. So in the United States, this means us fully acknowledging the forced displacement of Native Americans from traditional lands, the use of, of, of boarding schools to assimilate Native children, the enslavement of people of African descent. It starts with that self-reflection. Um, so something you're very passionate about, uh, but for the sake of time, let me stop there and, and, and turn it back to you. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for those opening remarks. Um, Ajene. Sure. Your thanks. Thoughts. Yes, thank you so much, Fritz. Thank you, uh, ICAP and Corbell, for this um, honor of, of joining the distinguished panel. Um, so I'm not convinced that you need a blameless history to preach to others, <laughs> as long as you have the honesty, courage, and humility, as Michael said, necessary to rectify the past and deal with your current issues while you're preaching to others. Um, you know, people will forgive your past. They don't tend to appreciate being hit in the present, whether it's by our hand or our hypocrisy. To put a fine point on it, um, it, it's not our perfection that makes the United States leaders. It's our struggle to perfect that makes us leaders. And so when, for example, indigenous, Asian, brown and white folks join hands with black folks to agree that black lives in fact matter, following the murder of George Floyd, that demonstrated our acknowledgement of our own injustice uh, that we wanted to collectively improve upon. And Americans marching towards ideals of racial equity and justice inspired protests globally. As Darren mentioned, the United States catalyzed protests in at least 40 other countries, nearly all of which were democracies, with people both organizing in solidarity and condemnation of what happens here, but also, and perhaps more importantly, pushing for equality within their own countries. The United States ability to carry out racial equity and justice completely hinges on its strength as a democracy. Rule of law, justice, freedom of movement, religion and speech, human rights, civil liberties, equality and equity, these all rise and fall on the health of democracy. But the Freedom House, which scores countries across multiple democratic dimensions, has noted erosion in the US, meaning we are moving in the wrong direction. So can the United States be an effective global advocate for racial equity and justice? I don't think we have to wait until we get it right to encourage others to move toward these ideals. But as others have said, I think we have to uh, work very hard very hard to get our own house in order simultaneously while we are out here with our bullhorns. Uh, strengthening our democracy will actually bolster our ability to carry out equity internally, thereby allowing us to lead by example. So I'd like to take just a couple minutes to explain how the threats to democracy and equity are interwoven, why the threats are internal, and therefore why it's incumbent upon us to turn inward, and what we can do to begin addressing this interconnected problem. To me, democracy is the closest a society can come to getting all of its members what they want and need to succeed in life. The challenge is that people disagree on what's needed to succeed, how, uh, how much people should pay, who should pay, and the solutions for getting there. We might say then that democracy is a political method for managing difference a governing structure that tries to achieve a fair way of managing the different priorities and preferences people have because of their different backgrounds and points of view. 
In democracies, as we know, there are competing ideas advanced by various groups, often opposing one another, but with each group vying for control to carry out their agenda, there is this tendency to convert difference, which is normal and expected and even healthy, into cause for division. And that is a problem. Actually, I would argue that the greatest threat to powerful democracies, including our own in the United States, is internal. You know, hyper competition and individualism are among some of the distractions tempting us to veer off course. So in their quest for power, people forget they are on the same side in their pursuit of righteousness. People dismiss that there may be more than one correct answer in their drive for supremacy. People exclude the genius of the marginalized in their demands for security. People deny the humanity of those they do not understand. It is written that a house divided against itself cannot stand. This does not mean we should settle for a unified facade propped up by superficial peace. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, quote, peace is not the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. That is, when we seek justice inside our own borders, within our own walls and in our own homes, we stand on and for truth and reconciliation. We listen actively. We confront pain constructively. We repair. We heal. We do the work necessary to grow ourselves and protect each other. For if we stop caring, if we stop caring for each other as a collective, if we withdraw our faith in one another, then our society will fail to be in relationship. Why does this matter, you might ask? Democracies are a particularly fragile form of government in that they rely on cooperation. Democracies rely on trust, on faith, on hope, on belief. And forces like cynicism, hatred, and indifference are especially corrosive. This means that every resident, every resident, has a moral imperative to build upon a system that fairly delivers what we all need to thrive and that maintains the health of that system by keeping the body politic in relationship with one another. That successful, diverse, cohesive body politic will provide the evidence needed to continue to inspire others around the world. Thank you, Ajane. Thank you all. Um, wow. That's, uh, um a rich and provocative set of initial uh, comments. Uh, we could go in so many uh, directions with uh, with all of this. Um, let me let me uh, just to pick one off. In some sense, all of you are talking about in various forms the necessity of coming to grips with our own history and realities as 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 being in our interest in this modern world. I'm struck. We had uh, our last Friday. Uh, uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield was here, and I had the wonderful opportunity to have a conversation with her. And she she she, she described uh, someone saying to her, as a African American woman, "Isn't that a, a you know? Do you have a difficulty in your role because of of being a minority?" And she's absolutely not. It's a, it's a huge asset in in the in the world uh, to be. The face of the you know the United States at the United Nations because um, and so l let me draw you out a bit on this on this question of of how for all I guess I said at the beginning all the failings you know coming to grips with our own past and current failings uh, and really embracing diversity is actually an asset in in international affairs and I, I, I you've all spoken to that in different in different ways. Um, um, but I'm, I'm curious whether you, you could give us a little bit more uh, texture of the ways in which that actually plays out in in international engagements. And, and I we could I, I would just uh, I'll pick on I'll start with Michael. Uh, 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 your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I am. I love the question. Uh, maybe by giving you a sense of what I do might might help to to, to answer that. Uh, so in my work, 
my goal is to, to first and foremost, to listen, uh, to consult and collaborate with indigenous communities. Um, and if you, as you said, you know, coming from a, a from a marginalized historical community, uh, it, it's a plus for me to be able to be in this position and to and to meet with uh, members of other indigenous communities uh, as, as, as well. And I wanna stress that, that these communities uh, have agency and they've always had agency and they've, know, they've known better than, than anyone else the challenges that they face and, and what they need to overcome them. Now, the problem is, the issue is that they have been excluded from the room where decisions are being made that have directly impact them. And, and this is historic. I mean, this is, if you look on a global level, historically, uh, indigenous peoples for far too long have been informed or told uh, rather than consulted on decisions that impact them. Um, so coming from an indigenous perspective, looking at, 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 at the rights through an indigenous lens, um, the other thing I would add is, is, is that society tends to look or categorize indigenous peoples as historical figures, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Whose, whose time has passed, that we're part of a history book and, and our, 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 our time and period is, is well over, which isn't true. Uh, I would encourage uh, society to, to, to look to Native peoples as a significant element in the construction of this unified world and the establishment of a global civilization, given the fact that there are over 400 million Indigenous people that occupy this world. Anyone else like to, 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 this was a theme, I don't know, Darren, you're, you were yeah. talking about this. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm happy to, to jump in on this. You know, I think um, Linda, uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield's comments were, um, I think, quite powerful, right? It's, it's Very. I think it's one thing, right, when we look at the importance of, you know, really um, the agenda of, of programs like ICAP, right, which is to, which is to increase the diversity of foreign policy leadership, right, it's about more than just kind of window dressing, right, or just looking like um, we have a diverse leadership. I think um, what a Linda Thomas Greenfield, an ambassador Thomas Greenfield, mm -hmm. represents is America's potential um, to heal in a very real, very tangible way. Right, I think one of the things that it's important for us to remember, right, um, and something that we always see in the global conversation is that America's um, history, right, and America's uh, challenges and, and America's history of racial injustice is known globally, right? I'm, I'm always amazed in my travels and conversations. Not a secret. <laughs> yeah, it's not a secret, right? It's it's folks know. Uh, what has taken place in the United States, and they know what is continuing to take place in the United States um, in very detailed, intimate ways. And so what I think um, an Ambassador Thomas Greenfield and a diverse leadership represents is the potential, right, for the United States um, to heal. But that's just the beginning of the conversation, right? Folks are also at the same time, they see an Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, they're still seeing these uh, videos, social media videos, day in and day out, um, showing folks being killed, right? The the Ralph Yarls who knock on the wrong door and are shot, or the, you know, Tyrese Nichols. And so that image of America um, is also quite present. And so I think returning to the, the, the theme of this panel, it's, uh, I agree with uh, the comments of all of the panelists, but the comment that Ajne made, which is that we don't have to you know, have corrected all of our wrongs in order to um, speak about the importance of racial equity in the world. But I think our words are taken much more powerfully when they are coupled with demonstrated efforts, right, um, to address these harms. And, and I think that's what we need to grapple with right now, because that history, our present of racial injustice, you know, our adversaries, our near peer adversaries, right, have no problem whatsoever um, bringing them up and powerfully when necessary um, to undermine the United States. And so, uh, you know, I think uh, I think our our goal should be, you know, not only because it's the right thing, but because it's also an effective thing. Let's nip that in the bud and say, yeah, but wait a second, 
you know, we also are actively working um, to address these ongoing ills. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Margaret, you started with that, but in, in almost a, so the mirror image thing, which is which is your your mission is very, of course, all of our missions is 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 worrying about and doing what we can uh, to advance justice in this country, but. Uh, you're, it was in your, you're, you're sort of making the same point. The world is watching us. Uh, we can, and that's helpful to you uh, in the efforts uh, from where you sit right now. Absolutely, Fritz. I will, I will note, I agree with you, Darren. I love running into folks uh, on international travels who took inspiration from the civil rights movement, who will quote Dr. King or Malcolm X or another civil rights leader and talk about how meaningful it has been for them to learn about the US experience. And yet these same people are so surprised that the structural inequities here in the United States are still so significant and vast and cover so many different parts of our work. I think in many ways, the Black Lives Matter movement was necessary to remind people that while we did successfully win the vote, theoretically, for all people in the country in the 1960s, that so much has not changed. Um, and certainly on indigenous rights issues, as Michael has alluded to already, there has been very little recognition of either the history or the impact of the treatment of indigenous peoples in this country. So. Lots of work to do. Let me just lift up because Ajane's point about democracy being key to helping to resolve some of these issues. One of the biggest challenges we have right now is that people don't have not fully realized the threat to democracy and particularly the threat to voting rights. Um, I think the assumption is we now have voting rights for everyone. And yet, if you look at state legislature after state legislature in the Deep South, where I am, you have seen just in this last session, legislative session this year, an extraordinary attack on democracy. Whether it is Mississippi, where the super white majority legislature has literally taken democratic authority away from the voters of Jackson, the capital of the of the state where 80% of the population is black and they've now given the authority over that part of the state to an, a white appointed leadership and a white appointed police force. Um, what happened in Tennessee that we were all, I was glued to my television and my Twitter feed trying to follow what was happening, but the, the decision to expel two young black legislators because they joined their constituents in calling for action by the state legislature was again, extraordinary and marked in its racism because only the two of them were expelled, not the third woman who participated who was white. And then of course you have what just happened in Georgia, which is the state legislature, the white uh, supreme, um, the supermajority white legislature in Georgia has now appointed a committee to oversee DAs in the state and to remove them from office if they're not happy with their political decisions, which is clearly intended to threaten uh, A.D. Willis as she's con contemplating charges against the former president. So these are steps that are being taken because we were successful in winning the vote in the 60s, but the, the, the win is not final and it's still under threat. And I think, I think all of these demonstrate the significance of the right to vote and of retaining and protecting that right and, and defending it vehemently against these attacks that we have to do if we hope to successfully advance a racial equity agenda anywhere in the country, not just in these states, but we keep seeing that the South introduces the terrible bills and then they get adopted everywhere else in the country. So we need to, we need to recognize the threats that are coming from the deep South and being spread across the country. And I think that's at the forefront for us, for sure. Uh, thank you for that. Now, Ajahn, I was going to, and Margaret set you up in, in a lot of ways and may draw you out on this. I love you, that you you brought in democracy as a, as a sort of core theme here and, the, and, and a particular vision of what uh, democracy and the extent to which, um, you know, our advocacy for democracy, our interest in promoting democracy internationally uh, hinges on 
uh, to a great extent on on our success at home. And uh, so I, I wonder if you have, if you say say a bit more about as you, you well know, you know a lot of work going on here at the school about you know democracy. We tend to we I think it's easy to forget. Uh, or to to look abroad at the rise of authoritarianism and sort of lament that uh, without uh, as careful an examination of the issues that uh, I know you alluded to and 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 spend time thinking about. So maybe maybe I could draw you out just a bit more on on that connection. Oh, sure. I mean, there are so many dimensions <laughs> that are under threat. I mean, and Margaret did a great job of covering, you know, we have, uh, you know, freedom of religion um, being rolled back. And in some ways, I mean, you have uh, two sides of the same coin with when, when, when folks are talking about freedom of speech, right, then people kind of pivot to freedom of religion. But then when Muslims want to assert their freedom of religion, they will pivot to uh, matters of security and national security. Um, when we talk about life, uh then you know then uh pre pre-born life is the focus but then um then we'll pivot and we'll talk about responsibility personal responsibility after those lives are born um so we are just like inconsistent in how we um in how we represent uh, those values, um, but also um, as we're talking about free speech, as we're talking about cancel culture, as we're talking about uh, 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 the importance of life and, and and how much we should cherish that, we sort of switch gears um, to roll that back on a legis on a state legislative scale, state by state at the same time. So, um, you know, that's where this for, from civil liberties to religious liberties to um, you know freedom of literally movement, the ability to deliver the pizza to somebody, you know, and get paid um, <laughs> without losing your life and being shot at in the driveway or at the door. Um, freedom of movement, the ability to pick up and um, and move uh, into another neighborhood and not be accosted uh, by folks who live there, uh, demanding to know, demanding proof that you belong there. Um, so all these basic things that, you know, people imagine when they say this is a free country don't apply to all kinds of folks on a daily basis. And um, at this point, uh, you know, we see legislature by legislature across the country, you know, from Wisconsin um, and Michigan and Ohio and, you know, Pennsylvania and other places, um, uh, whether that's happening at the local level or it's happening at the state level, um, we see efforts to um, kind of retrench and go back to uh, what it was before um, before people of color were really consolidating and expressing their votes and gaining political power. Thank you for that. And um, uh, let me uh, see many people are putting uh, their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I invite you to do that. We will, we'll, I'm going to ask one more question, basically, and then we'll, we're going to turn to to the audience for for um, for two as many of your questions as we can address in the in the time that we have. Um, let, let me um, I'll come back to you, Ajane, so uh, and, and, and uh, to start at least on this. So um, I guess the question is really uh, one of the opportunity uh, here. And, and by that, I mean, and some of you, you've already talked in, in different ways about this, but this is sort of looking at the, it's, it's so Ajane and, and, and we've all sort of identified many of the issues facing, uh, you know, that are problematic uh, and are in our own society and that continue to undermine our ability to do, to lead in the world. I'm, I'm, I'm curious though, what you turning it around is sort of in thinking about what is the great opportunity or is there a great opportunity for the United States uh, to make good on its promises? You, as you know, said it's not that we're per it's the it's that we're on the on the path towards something, uh, uh, you know. But to make good or, or to uh, or, uh, as good as we can or better, and and in that way, be really uh, uh, regain that soft power. Be really an appealing force in, in a world, a diverse world. Uh, you know, as Michael, you point out in particular, a world of, of multiple indigenous populations, a world of great diversity. 
you know, is there, a, you know, is is that uh, the sort of affirmative vision of what we're talking about is the great opportunity at this point where I think in the United States, we feel that we're losing credibility, losing influence in the world is to seize that opportunity to be more of the model we uh, perhaps have imagined some of us have liked to imagine we were, um, but to be more in that space. So I don't know how you would react to that. I'll start with you, Ajne, because you were enumerating some of the, you know, the very, very real issues that, we, you know, that face our polity at the moment. What sure. do you have to say about that? Sure, thanks. And I think policing is actually a really good kind of microcosm through which to answer this question. So um, the famous poet, essayist, uh, advocate for abolition, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, once wrote, uh, your actions speak so loudly, I cannot hear what you are saying. And of course, our shorthand for that is actions speak louder than words. But over time, or excuse me, one time in my own um, research, I went to a neighborhood that was experiencing great tensions between the police and the community. And in my interview with this young man, I asked him, are there any values, morals, ethics, or standards you think are important for police to have? And, uh, and he told me, quote, you would think police would have some decent values. I mean, they probably got some values when they go home, but you don't get to turn your values on and off. You treat people how you wanna be treated. They don't treat people how they wanna be treated. <laughs> Simple stuff, stuff our grandparents taught us end quote. So I think there are two valuable lessons here. One is, uh, first, in treating people how you want to be treated, uh, Malik, as I call him, is saying to lead by example, right? In other words, if you want others to follow you, then it's going to have to be your actions that lead the way. And we've talked about that. But secondly, values are only values when they are consistent. <laughs> if we're turning them on and off when it's convenient, then it's not a value at all you know, or at least it's not a core value. So values are what we cherish. They are what motivate us. Indeed, they're what define us. It's who we are. And as a public policy professor, I talk to my students all the time about values because they are what uh, infuse what we see as problems, as solutions, the actions that we as individuals and our governments take, uh, the actions we don't take, the actions don't even, we don't even try to take. And like the young man was saying in the interview, a value is not a value unless you still do it when it is costly, when you are willing to sacrifice for it. Um, you know, what are you willing to spend? Who will pay the cost? Whom do we let die? Who do we think deserves to live? And when we step back and look at all these answers in the aggregate, when we crunch the data, it tells us a lot about who we are, not who we say we are, but who we in fact are. And this is why one of the clearest desires among my interviewees for police officers, you know, those with the greatest amount of power in their lives, uh, is for them to be role models alongside their primary role as crime stoppers. And I would definitely relate this uh, to the simultaneous role that the United States must play as role models and stoppers of crime against humanity because we have but because we have so much wealth and power. Thank you for that. Um, you go to to any of you. I'm just uh, you know uh, uh, maybe maybe to Margaret uh, uh, in terms of thinking about the sort of affirmative vision of what we could be. Uh, Sure. So one of the things that we are um, currently advocating for is the creation of a national human rights institution. This is a mechanism that 110 plus countries around the world have already instituted. Um, they enable governments to look at human rights obligations under international treaties and make recommendations about how we could be more effective in meeting those obligations in domestic implementation. You all will know better than most that uh, the US only accepts treaty obligations that are already in force under domestic law, which is very limiting in terms of uh, interpreting uh, what the international standards might be. But a national human rights institution could be an incredibly valuable mechanism for doing that. 
I will say um, we don't have any hopes that the current Congress would actually help to create an institution like that at this time, but there are steps that this particular administration with its commitment to age, racial equity being as explicit as we've seen it uh, in the first couple of years has the opportunity to advance some of those pieces. And in fact, the only two countries in the Americas hemisphere that have, don't have a national human rights institution are Brazil and the United States. So it, we're, we're far overdue to take that action. Is it a panacea? Certainly not. But it would give us another mechanism with some opportunity to actually hold domestic agencies to account. That's our biggest challenge. We're, we're thrilled about the office that Michael is part of now at State Department, but it's at the State Department. It's dealing with foreign policy, and, and we're all talking about the need to look at domestic policy, uh, policies with the same eye. And so that's what a national human rights institution can do. Oh, that's great. Very specific and, and uh, promising avenue. Uh, Darren, let me turn to you. You you have you you gave us a wonderful historical perspective of of this sort of enduring nature of these issues as as you think about this for the you know kind of looking a bit more into the future. How do you, how would you uh, tackle this? Yeah, I think um, you know your question about well, what's an affirmative uh, vision for how the U.S. could start to to reckon with our past and um, and become a you know a viable advocate for racial equity and justice in the world. I think, you know, as, as I said before, I think, you know, it begins at home. And I think one of the things that um, would be important for us to begin to do in the United States is to um, have an honest and ongoing um, reckoning, right, with our past, racial injustice in our past and our present, right? And so when we look at our, you know, we look at other states, um, around the world, as as Margaret mentioned, you know, one of the tools for reckoning with the past um, in the transitional justice space has been this idea of truth commissions, truth and reconciliation commissions, um, the idea of reparations. And I I can remember in the not too long distant past, right, when the conversation about reparations was considered to be, um, you know, kind of political dynamite. And, and I'm pleased to say that we've actually, I think, reached a point uh, in terms of the dialogue in the United States where, if not at the national level, right, some research that I, that I currently have completed, we see that there are over 100 truth and reconciliation commission initiatives and reparation initiatives that are um, popping up at the local state um, community level. Um, many of them. Um, inspired by um, efforts to begin to address racial injustice um, because of the conversation that was reinvigorated after um, the death of George Floyd. And so I think it is that ongoing effort to reckon with past and present ills, whether it's through a truth and reconciliation process at the local level, state or national level, dealing with specific issues, um, or efforts at reparation, uh, that is, I think, what needs to be part of that affirmative vision where we're not hiding from the past, right? Right now, um, Fritz, in some earlier conversations, right, we acknowledge that there's an effort, right, in some places in the country right now to prevent a conversation, yeah. right, about racial injustice in the schools and otherwise. And so I think we need to, to battle that with a conscious affirmative um, effort to consistently reckon with our ongoing challenges and to realize that that makes us stronger, not weaker. Yeah. Um, so that needs to be part of the vision. Yeah, I like. I like. I mean, the the those who are who are uh, leading those uh, efforts to suppress uh, the history uh, and the like often seem to make the case that somehow it makes us weaker to uh, in the world that we should. You know, we, we should hide those things, and, and but I agree with you that it, you know, these, this is a, both a sign of and a source of strength uh, for a society to be able to to do that. Uh, Michael, I'm sure they, these themes I know resonate de deeply with you, and and you, you may have more you would like to say on that, or or or, or other thoughts you might have. Oh, absolutely. I, I, thanks uh, for this opportunity again. Um, 
I, I love this idea of this great opportunity, as you said, for it's uh, what the U.S. can be, uh, the important activities. I, I just want to take it even a step further. What not only what we could be as a nation, but what we could be as a global community, given this important diversity that exists, uh, given these important topics we need to to, to, to focus on. I, I mentioned um, just briefly in, in the last statement that there are over. 400 million indigenous peoples across our world and they're living in they live in over 90 countries throughout 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 the globe um and, and many are are stewards of of diverse uh, critical issues uh, they are a source of traditional knowledge without a doubt strategies on sustainability and i would say this includes climate change this inc includes uh food security issues this includes equitable governance and these are all these are all issues that that are important to our existence and survival as as a global community. And, and I would I would uh, underscore that indigenous peoples are also uniquely positioned to, to develop and implement um, culturally appropriate sustainable solutions. Um, and I would say go as far as saying this includes local, uh, regional, national, and and need to they need to be part of a global policies and strategies, communications, and conversations. Um, we we all all of us here domestically working domestically and internationally uh help to work together to help to foster a, a a i would say more inclusive society where indigenous peoples and, and frank let me be frank all people of color are, are free to reach their their potential and, and welcome to share this traditional knowledge a, invited to 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 share their unique perspective on how the issues that we confront as a planet can 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 be faced uh, with this traditional knowledge, with the, this this unique background and perspective that exists. Um, it, it's it's my personal belief uh, that the transformation of, of society necess necessitates each and every one of us, uh, and so not allowing for a a, a diverse perspective of, of thought, a diverse perspective on, on just so many issues was going to hinder our own ability to to achieve what what we could achieve as a, as a collective global society. So so preventing even a, a segment of, of, of humanity of of this conversation uh, is going to be detrimental to to the rest of us on, on all the, all these issues we face. I love that. I love the way you've taken this to the global level and understanding the ways in which. Ultimately, as a global community, we need diversity uh, uh, to to tackle these issues, whether it's climate change or the host of other issues that are common across the across the planet. Um, I would love to continue monopolizing the conversation, but I did promise our audience that I would turn to, to uh, some questions. Or so. thank you to all of those who put questions in the question box. I, uh, we could uh, there's so many good questions here. I, I, let me, let me, um, one question I, I think is interesting because, uh, in a way we've talked both about governments and, 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 and non-government and other actors. And so the question is, uh, you know, is the guiding question referring to the United States government or to this country's people? Um, because there are very different questions with very different answers historically, uh, and currently important to consider both. And so uh, it, 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 it's interesting to think of the role of citizens, of nonprofit organizations, of other non-governmental, as well as governmental actors in this space. And you know, who, Margaret, do you want to maybe jump on that one? Sure. Well, the, the quick response on this is that international human rights law applies to governments. Um, and while your point is an important one, the person who asked the question, and there are many, many ways that people to people diplomacy can go much further than anything we can actually do under government channels. The whole purpose of having international laws where governments are obligated to comply is for accountability measures. So we actually do want governments to feel accountable and responsible for I have a light that keeps turning off, sorry, uh, that uh, governments, that we hold them accountable to those obligations under international law. And that's why it's important that we not, we not throw up our hands and say the government may not be the best actor in this, in this particular debate. The one other thing I'll say is um, there's a really interesting phenomenon globally that 
we in the United States talk about race and racial equity far more than most other countries. Um, it is both an advantage and a disadvantage. Uh, we as advocates talk about it all the time <laughs> at the United Nations. It's actually at the, at the heart of our international advocacy in, in large part because the US has actually ratified the race discrimination treaty, unlike so many others. But it's no question that advocates from the US are always talking about race. Whereas advocates who wanna talk about racial equity in other countries have a much more difficult time and often are not a racial equity focused organization, but a human rights organization that raises issues of disparities and discrimination. And I think that's, um, I think it's something that actually makes me very proud to be part of a US discourse about this. I think it's another way in which, despite all of the failings of the United States, that we can be a leader because we don't allow our government to shirk its responsibilities, particularly in this area. But I'd, I'd actually love to hear from my colleagues what your experience has been. I suspect it's been something similar, but, um, but how race plays out uh, at the global level, because it is quite different in other parts of the world. No. Want to pick up on that or the uh, uh, anyone uh, on that challenge or the, or the underlying question? I can call on you or we can go to another question. Michael, I yeah. see you unmuted. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give it a shot. I think I, uh, if I understand the correct the, the, the question correctly, uh, I, already, I already gave you a kind of a global State Department perspective. I just want to maybe go a different way on this discourse, discourse of, of race on a global level. Um, and since since uh, you know here we are uh, uh, on air with with you, Fritz, and, and members of the you know of the university, and I, I think one I one particular important area is to look at the role of universities, professors, researchers uh, on, on race uh, on, on the global level. Um, and, and I touched briefly, I, and I know I, my colleagues on the panel did as well about this, this, this reckoning about reflecting our own, our own acknowledging our own history, right? Uh, no matter how tragic and how horrible it is, it's important to do so. I would say that uh, looking globally at, at race, I would say that, that professors, researchers, students, universities are no different. There has to be this, this self-reflection. I know as, as a government employee, as a government official, you know, we, we look at this idea of, of international relations, the this, this, this study of international relations. Um, looking at that uh, gives you a, a perspective that once you come out of school, you're, you're kind of just focused on that and drawn into it. And, and I think a lot of it is is focused and has erased this idea of this non-Western history and thought. I think it's failed to to address colonialism, decolonialization. Uh, I know when when I was studying, uh, you know, you start uh, IR at, in 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia, and you look through that nation-state lens. And but this idea of of, of colonialism, expansion of, of others of other cultures, uh, completely ignored. At least when I was, you know, it's gone, and and hopefully it, it has changed. I'm sure it has. I hope. Um, but I would say that scholars uh, have to come to terms themselves with, with this idea, to highlight, underscore these forgotten communities, these forgotten cultures that have truly shaped global affairs. And, and the other thing is, is, is to focus on the, the racism and, and the marginalization of, of ethnic indigenous communities can't be seen purely as, as a domestic issue either. Um, and, and just give you one example that comes to mind, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and, and Charles Eastman. Charles Eastman was the first Native American to, to graduate with a degree, degree in Western medicine from, I think, Boston University, if I'm not mistaken. They certainly didn't see racism and colonialism as a purely domestic issue. When they participated in 1911 in London at the Universal Racist Conference, they both spoke, ar articulated the ideas about racism, the effects of colonialism, and that was on an international level, coming from two very important communities within the United States. So in, this idea, looking back in the early 20th century, you have Black and Indigenous groups, you had intellectuals focused that the, this idea of race, racism is a global issue that needed global solutions. So with that, I think there we all have a part to play. And I guess that's my message in, in looking from, from scholars, students, professors, and others, this idea of, 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 of global racism and what that really means. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for 
posing the challenge back at back to us as it as it happens we 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 just have a project funded by Carnegie Corporation of New York to rethink uh, inter, you know education for international affairs and very much along these lines uh, uh, recognizing the frankly racist history of the profession uh, uh, and of the paradigms that have dominated it um, and uh, very much looking the themes you mentioned uh, understanding that racism is, racism is a global phenomenon uh, thinking about the legacy of colonialism and decolonizing uh, and really uh, trying to uh, challenge ourselves to think from first principles and anew about how we teach about think about and teach about international affairs so I mean, we'll, I'll come, I'm going to come back. You, you, I'm going to draw you into this project, <laughs> or frankly, all of you, um, uh, Darren. I saw you. You. you uh, yeah. Yeah. Here. Actually, Michael made a point, um, and it, it actually harkened back to to Margaret's opening remarks, where she um, she quoted uh, Carol Anderson's "Eyes Off the Prize," right? And and so one of the the wonderful uh, uh, pieces of, of Carol Anderson's work is that she really. Um, reveals in depth the role that um, civil rights leaders played, right, during the negotiation of the UN Charter, mm. pushing that negotiation to include language on human rights, right, because it was civil rights activists and leaders in the United States, as well as, you know, human rights activists around the world who realized um, and hoped that in, with the formation of the United Nations, this would create another form right, for them to pursue and advocate for rights which were denied by their own domestic governments. Um, and, and in many ways, we're, you know, we're in the same place today. Margaret, you mentioned the CERD, right, that, again, enough, uh, civil rights leaders, a former dean of my institution, C. Clyde Ferguson, right, civil rights leader, and he understood um, one of the main proponents of uh, drafting the CERD, he understood that we also would need global tools um, to pressure states uh, to do the right thing. And so I think that theme, that tradition, organizations like um, Margaret's organization, SPLC, uh, NAACP, all of our great human rights and civil rights groups understand that, right? That it's about advocacy, yes, within the domestic system, but it's also about using the tools that exist at the global level to pressure states to do the right thing. So that conversation that we have in the U.S., I think, is is something that we um, also inspiring others. Um, and uh, the the use of global tools is quite important to pressure states to do the right thing. Oh, thank you for that. And Ajane, Ajane let me give you a, share, a share <laughs> to comment on this as well. I know a lot of your work bears on this. So. Well, I'll try to be quick. I just wanted to say that um, that I think with the, with the question of whether it's government or whether it's us, um, it's both, and particularly because we belong uh, to a democracy that we um, we have a lot of power. I mean, yes, yes, those rights are eroding, but they're still there. And to the extent that they're there, uh, we do have the ability to pressure our government to do the right thing. And so there are certain tools, uh, there are certain levers that can only be pushed, um, pulled at the at the government level. And so that needs to happen. But then uh, we need to be doing our part as citizens, both to pressure our government, but also, frankly, to address our own role, um, you know, on the domestic side. So we got to you know, kind of account for our personal talents and capacities and then get in where we fit in um, and make this a very personal journey uh, so that, you know, we're not we don't have the time and the energy to, to battle on all fronts. We don't want to burn out, but, um, you know, really doing an honest assessment and seeing, OK, what can I do right now and um, making this very personal to ourselves. I have an embarrassment of uh, so many questions, so many things we could pursue. We only have a little bit more time. Let me ask. Let me take one more question for the audience, and then we'll we'll have a, a, a couple of minutes maybe for final comments and maybe we just quick reactions to the this one. And so the the question is what what is it particularly about our democracy and domestic struggle that appears to allow for or potentially contribute to the the apparent perpetual battle within our own culture, but Standing upon that, how, how can we effectively lead the globe to address and assist equally complex issues within other cultures that are similarly uh, situated or similarly nuanced, I think is the word here. What is it about our struggle that 
positions us to be helpful to others, both in maybe the global, but also as in this, at least in this question, within other countries. Thoughts on that? Would like to take that. I'm going with Darren. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll jump in. You know, I, I think it's it's a great question, right? Because when we we think about the the struggle in the United States, um, you know, in some ways we think about the uniqueness of uh, various uh, ongoing issues of racial inequity, but when we expand it out, right, and and look at the issue globally, we see many of the same themes, yeah. right, and and particularly I, I want to point back to kind of the global protests, um, the the protests that we saw following the death of George Floyd, which were global in nature. What was interesting about many of those protests is yes, many of them were um, about solidarity, right, and allyship with what was happening in the United States, but just as many um, protests were also tied to ongoing issues, right, of police abuse and, and state violence um, that were occurring, right? And so the context might be different, right, but the same themes of um, the right to freedom of expression, the right to live one's life, um, irrespective of one's color, religion, gender, theme, right, the, the, our gender background, those are the same themes that we see playing out in different contexts. And I think because we've, you know, uniquely struggled with all of them in a very multi-plural um, society in the United States, I think that struggle allows us to see um, the nature of those divisions, which, you know, might be distinct to a particular context, but the ongoing themes are the same. And again, I think it also ties back to the fact that the United States is uh, our history, um, our presence is so globally understood and so well known that I think that also opens the door for those conversations. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Other, others quickly on this on this question, and then we'll do a quick round robin at the end. But uh, Margaret, yeah, I was going to defer to Michael. Please, Michael, go oh, ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Well, Margaret, um, then, and then we'll, and then Ajani, and then we'll come to uh, Very good, thank you. Thank you, Fritz. Um, I think that was a great way to kick off, Darren. And I, you know, what strikes me is um, at the bottom of all of this is a real problem with white supremacy. White supremacy is, is what has led to the structural inequities in our country over and over again in every sector and in every part of our history. It is what is currently fighting voting rights protections in the country and trying to eliminate access to the levers of power for communities of color, for young people, for anybody who might disagree with the longstanding premise of white supremacy. And Many of the people who are fighting so hard to erase history from our classrooms or books from our libraries have a real problem with acknowledging that concept um, because we're supposed to be in a post-racial era now, right? We've had a black president, we're, we're no longer sort of mired in our history. And yet, if you look across this country, we've been tracking monuments to the Confederacy for the last several years and there are literally thousands of monuments to the Confederacy in this country in every state. That means that people have been unwilling to let go of the, of the Confederacy built on white supremacy um, to the point where they won't change names of, of elementary schools or take down statues to former enslavers. It is a huge, huge challenge across the country. And one that we actually don't see that same level of celebration of that terrible history anywhere else in the world. When you go and you look, well, that's not true. There are a few other places in the world. But if you go to Germany, for example, and look at what they teach in their classrooms in Germany, they're very honest about the history of the Nazis. They don't try to pretend that the Nazis were a group of people who did some bad things, but otherwise, you know, the, the history of Germany is wonderful and, and everybody wants to make Germany great again. That's not the practice in Germany. So that is something we have to wrestle with and, and we can no longer do it 
by just pretending that white supremacy is this thing that we all know about but don't talk about, we actually have to name it more. And I'm saying that because the refusal to deal with that openly and to talk about its implications for our ongoing challenges is part of why we're now fighting whether a school library can include Toni Morrison or not. I mean, it's just, these are ridiculous fights because we won't reckon with our actual history. Sorry to take so long, but yeah, no, no, I'm well, spending a lot of time thinking about that lately. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's so hot it's uh, and so present right now that there's a uh, backlash against the effort to be more honest about our history. Michael, you were, you were gonna uh, jump in on this? Very quickly, uh, just to to, to, to to put stop what Darren and Margaret both said, Darren on, on the similar themes. I know looking indigenous at indigenous rights, global indigenous rights, if you look at the issues faking, facing Native American tribes here, uh, it, the issues are very similar to what's happening around the world. You're looking at the overrepresentation of, of indigenous peoples in, in the prison system. You're looking at poor health education systems. Um, the same can be found in, in, in countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, throughout countries around the world, it, looking very similar, uh, looking at these indigenous populations, because as, as Margaret mentioned, there are similar colonial history in these countries and throughout the world. And so we're still dealing with this and this idea, and, 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 and that, as, as Darren said, we still have these, these similar themes, uh, these ideas of, of boarding schools were not unique to the United States, they are global. Uh, the, 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 the increased numbers of, of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls around the world is an issue, of course, here in Mexico and Canada, but all throughout the world, again, based, uh, as my two colleagues stated, on this similar colonial history that, that uh, we have yet to, to come to grips with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ajna, I promise to come to you first as we wrap up because I keep coming to you last, but, uh, you know, on this question of, of our struggle and its relationship to our ability to engage effectively with other societies. Your thoughts? Mm. Or wherever you were going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think, yeah, my fellow panelists uh, made the great case for um, how we can like build on um, why we should, um, why we should be joining with you know other countries and and fighting on these issues um how we can build on things that we have done well but you know i would just add that it's we have the obligation to i mean we have the obligation to because of our wealth and our military might um we have the obligation to improve no that's that's the uh, that's a really important point um we're we're at time uh, uh pretty much uh and um I, I hesitate to even do this because it's such a nuanced and rich and uh, wonderful discussion, but maybe just to take a minute, any last thoughts any of you have about uh, things that uh, that you want to lift up as, as really uh, central to the conversation we've had or something we perhaps failed to address? Uh, and I did promise to start with you, Ajane. <laughs> Well, you know, going back to um, the young man's comment about about things that our grandparents taught us, you know, I just think about, you know, how do you feel about people, you know, who never apologize when they're wrong, people who hurt others intentionally and unintentionally, and when it's brought to their attention, they blame the person for being weak, you know, do you see this as a strength? Are you inspired to follow? Is that how you would actively teach children in your life how to treat one another? Um, you know, how is it that these time tested, time honored principles of the human experience go out the window when we enlarge the scale to include global populations and, and nations and nation building? They don't. They don't. So, you know, we are the most powerful nation on the earth. And dare I say, we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Thank you for that. Um, Michael. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm glad you you mentioned earlier uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield. Uh, I've worked with him in the past, and it was I was actually in New York a couple of weeks ago, so it was great to see her in in New York. I was there for the uh, opening session of the UN Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues, and it's a permanent forum that's been around since about 2000, focused on global Indigenous issues. And so, it's very important to, to to be there and to hear what the world is facing, and for us to be able to amplify that and help help do that. So, uh, very 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 proud to to be there. 
I guess in the end, um, what it all comes down to, I would say, is is inherently about all of us acknowledging um, the dignity and value of every human being. Um, I know hearing what is we're all facing, it can be overwhelming, can be daunting, can be discouraging at times, but I would say all of us uh, listening here, all of us working towards these, these ends, whether it's a government official like me, members of civil society, uh, as we touched on students and professors, uh, members of the private sector, um, all, all have an important role to play so that uh, together we can, we can work to overcome these institutional barriers and, and, and truly, uh, truly work towards, towards helping the individuals live up to their full potential so that we could live up to ours as, as a global community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Darren. Yeah, I just, um, um, I think the last thought I'd like to, to leave the group with actually um, is in response to, to one of the questions that was posed. And the question was, you know, is the call of the question for our panel, can the U.S. be an effective global, ad global advocate for racial equity and justice in the world? Is that um, focused on the government or is it focused on the people of the United States? And I think all of us have approached this question, right, from the perspective of what the U.S. government as, as our representative um, should be saying in the world. But I love the question, right, because it, 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 it acknowledges the fact that it's not just the government, right, that has the role of representing the U.S. It's all of us, right, in our individual capacities through NGOs like Margaret's organization, um, through um, academic institutions, we all can be effective advocates in the world for racial justice and equity by being honest, right? By being honest about our history and our present and by being honest about um, the work uh, that we all need to do um, to address that past. And I think that makes us uh, better advocates um, for the same work um, that needs to be taken on in countries around the planet. That's great. Thank you, Darren. And uh, Margaret, I guess you get the last word here. Mm. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Fritz. I, I agree. We could have kept going for quite a while longer. I love the comments from my colleagues on this last round. And I was thinking a little bit about um, the advocacy that we've done with the United Nations on behalf of the Southern Poverty Law Center, as well as it with other nonprofits I've been part of. And there's no question that some of the most powerful advocacy has not been from advocates like me, <laughs> but has been from individuals who have directly experienced the injustices of the United States, who on their own behalf and on behalf of others who share their identity or their experience have gone to the United Nations and advocated on their own behalf. Um, and I'm thinking, of course, not only of the Indigenous Peoples Forum that Michael referenced, and now the new People of African Descent Working Group and for Permanent Forum that's been established, both of which are enormously significant and create opportunities for that type of direct representation and voice. Um, but even in treaty reporting and obligations, uh, we brought two formerly incarcerated colleagues to Geneva who gave the testimony about what incarceration is like in the Deep South and, and how it has violated so many international standards. And there's just no question that hearing those voices in the room with the experts, they were the experts. There's nobody else in that room who could explain the way that they could, what their experience was and what it meant for human rights. So I think, I think the question is exactly right. And I think we have to be thinking more about how we use our democracy as Anjanai uh, has already called upon us to do, to better ensure that the voices of those directly affected actually are heard directly by those who get to make the decisions about how we move forward, whether that's within our own governments, whether that's at the global level, but I think that's a really powerful direction for our future. 
Well, thank you for that. Uh, let me thank the, our audience for uh, joining us today. Uh, thank uh, my guests, uh, all of you uh, who participated in the conversation, all the panelists here. I, uh, it's been a privilege to be part of the conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to ICAP for uh, its great work and uh, its history and its legacy on display here. Uh, and with that, I uh, wish you all a good uh, rest of your day and uh, a conversation that uh, we, we need to keep keep having and beyond the conversation, obviously, uh, we need to do things as well. So thank you all very, very much. <laughs>